Right. Hello. Welcome to this week's uh, lecture at the Oxford Natural History Museum. Uh, my name is Oliver Weeks. I'm the Curator of Earth Sciences here at the museum. And I'm also a paleontologist. Um, I have a master's degree from the University of Bristol in uh, paleontology and evolution. And this is a talk that focuses on my master's project, which is on the functional evolution of whale jaws. Um, a few weeks ago, I did a talk about uh, the early evolution of whales that you might have caught or maybe had a look at um, on our YouTube channel. Um, so we're first going to go through a little bit of a, a speed run of that, um, that talk. So what are whales? Just defining terms a little bit here. So when I say whales, I'm meaning anything that's got whale in its name. So the baleen whale, so blue whales, um, uh, humpback whales, things like that. Bow whale, bow, yeah, bowhead whales, uh, dolphins as well, things like killer whales, um, and also other toothed whales like sperm whales, and porpoises as well. The scientific term for whales in general is cetacea or cetaceans, um, so I might use that as well, I might go, in, go into that and use that. A um, couple of other bits of information here, there's 94 living species in the, the largest things that have ever lived. Um, largest animals, sorry. <clears throat> so if we go through the uh, first the evolution of whales, um, they've split off from their modern relatives um, about 54 million years ago. Um, the most closely related to hippos, but their kind of a mutual aquatic lifestyle is actually something that's um, been evolved separately. Um, they don't really look much like hippos today. So there's been a lot of evolution that's happened um, since then. Uh, they're also part of this broader group called of even-toed ungulates. So things like um, deer, cows, sheep, things like this. Um, and that is a broader group called the artiodactyles. So they evolved from kind of deer-like creatures that lived on land around about 54 million years ago, or after that point. So these are the early types of whales. We've got Indohyas here and Pachycetus, and they're very uh, terrestrial looking. They've got walking legs still. Uh, they, they, they were straying into um, rivers and streams and things like that. Um, tram going past. <laughs> uh, they were eating things like um, vegetation still. Uh, Pachycetus starting to go into eating things like um, fish. So they're, they're starting to acquire dietary adaptations that are um, more typical of dolphins and whales and things like this. So, oh, there we go. Uh, Ambulocetus is one of the next stages in whale evolution. They've got shorter limbs. They're more well adapted to uh, swimming uh, in uh, rivers, maybe even coastal waters. And then you get a little bit further, and you've got things like the Remington Acetes, sort of otter-like um, uh, early whales with these long, long jaws, and these more sort of um, uh, well-adapted marine creatures. They're starting to stray out into the open ocean uh, with the Protocetids. And then later on, you get the Basilosaurids, so things like Dorodon. And they're fully marine at this point. Um, so you can see already there's a lot of evolution that's happened. But what I'm going to be focusing on is mainly the evolution that happens in the skull and the jaw. So as we go into uh, modern whales, you start to get more uh, different types of strategies for feeding. So earlier on in their evolution, they tend to have this very typical, uh, what we call raptorial feeding. So it's basically what we have that here with ram prey capture. They, they go up to the animal, snap the prey item, and then consume it. It's what most things do on land, um, yeah, on land because um, you don't have the advantage of water. Uh, once you're in water, you can start using suction feeding, which is you're using the physics of water to literally draw in a prey item. So you, you, um, in your 
uh, mouth cavity, you produce like a, a partial vacuum that sucks in, sucks in the water, and the prey item comes in with the with the water. You can also do this sort of lateral snapping movement as well, which requires the elongation of the jaw as well. Um, so these are some of the unique sorts of um, strategies that evolve in in whales. Um, there's a couple of other cool um, types of jaws that are sort of extinct in um, in modern whales. You've got this huge sperm whale with massive teeth, and it could probably eat other whales. Um, it's called Leviathan. And then this, which is kind of um, an open ocean um, dolphin with a, a with a long, long jaw. They're usually um, things that have longer jaws today are usually in uh, more river type systems. Um, it's kind of a, more of a unique, uh, quite unique for that strategy. Um, the other um, part of the whale family tree is the uh, baleen whales. And they've got really, really um, unique feeding strategies um, because they do filter feeding. Um, they do bulk feeding. And they, they basically drawing a, lo a load of water and then sieve out the, um, the plankton from the water, which um, allows them to consume a lot of food all, uh, in one, uh, one, con one, um, one movement, basically. Um, so we've got skimming at the top, and that's a sort of a passive process that some whales do. They sort of just swim through the water, the um, water comes in, and things get uh, filtered out. Engulfing, which is a more active process where the whale comes up to the uh, like a, a, a bait ball and consumes it. Lunging as well is an even more active process. And then there's also some suction feeding as well, where they um, they do the same process but with um, things on the seafloor. Um, this is the evolution of uh, the the jaws in whales from the basilosaurus, like I mentioned earlier, with uh, Dorodon. Um, and uh, slowly, the, the jaw gets longer, and the... Okay. The, um, uh, the jaws get longer, and the, um, the bit that seals the, the jaw together starts to become elastic. And um, the the jaws separate. As you can see further down in the evolution, um, they have two separate jaws that can move almost independently of one one another, and that allows for the um, bulk consumption of of water. You can you can extend the uh, capacity, the volume of uh, of the mouth, and consume more water. Um, so I was looking to um, basically do an analysis of the function of these jaws as they evolve uh, back into the water and to the modern condition of um, whales. So we looked at some hypotheses for, um, for this uh, evolutionary transition. So we have basically the denser medium of water would impose a uh, significant functional constraint on the uh, jaws. Namely, they would have to increase their efficiency of their jaws um, because, of the, um, because of the density. Um, you, you're pulling your jaws through a denser medium, so you, you want to increase the efficiency and they decrease the amount of energy that you have to use to close your jaws. Um, moving into what would also constrain the jaw, jaw morphology, so it would actually become less diverse than it was when they were on land. Um, and that is because of this functional constraint that's going on here. Um, and also the few uh, new feeding ecologies would require different functions as well. So I've got down here a couple of examples that the apex predators might have higher jaw strength. Uh, filter feeders would have high rotational efficiency. Uh, suction feeders will also have higher rotational efficiency. Um, I'll come on to actually defining these terms in a second, but this was the method that we used. Um, so this is a paper by Deacon et al. So um, Will Deacon is the author of this one, and he was one of my supervisors on my master's, uh, along with Emily Rayfield and Phil Donahue. 
and uh, had some quite a lot of help from Tom Smith as well at Bristol. Um, so basically what happens is you take the uh, sample of whatever organism that you're looking at. So in this case, we have fish. Will's um, study was on uh, early fish. And you trace those jaws, and that gets subjected to an analysis called elliptical foreign analysis, um, which basically, I'll go through this a bit more in detail afterwards, but basically summarizes the jaw shape and turns it into um, shape data that you can then use to reconstruct uh, what we call a um, morphospace, which is basically a summary of um, jaw morphology on two axes, and then reconstruct from that the amount the shapes of the jaws at each point on that morphospace, and then subject each of those jaws to uh, functional analyses. So we've got here rotational efficiency analysis and their uh, von Mises stress, so like a, a, a stress resistance analysis. And then I didn't really focus so much on the optimality, uh, which is in uh, Deacon, uh, Will Deacon's paper. Um, but it basically is putting those two metrics together, which are kind of a universal, two universal things that organisms need to, well, animals need to um, optimize, because both strength and efficiency are really important, and looks at the optimality of that and um, how that changes through um, their evolution. So this is what I did. I got a sample of 166 animals in total, uh, 95 of which were whales, and 34 of these were on uh, were fossil whales. So this section here in blue are all the whales, and then I included an outgroup as well, 71 outgroup animals, and this was just to show the direction of change. So it actually could trace the evolution from the common ancestor, um, and then also kind of check that it was a directional change and not just two groups of organisms evolving in different directions. Um, you see all the, diff the, ver the variety of animals you've got up here as well. So this is, when I mentioned elliptical fire analysis, this is kind of what's going on here. It's quite difficult to picture. It's essentially, we've well, got a jaw and there's a trace of the jaw on the outside. Elliptical fire analysis uses ellipses of different sizes to basically summarize the shape. Um, you can actually see this is a skull that um, in this paper, a skull is being summarized by these elliptical uh, ellipses. And when you've got two of these, what we call harmonics, so two different ellipses, it's, it's creating this kind of egg shape. And then you add a third one here, it's kind of got a bit of a more, um, skull shape here and when you get up to 20 harmonics you're basically getting the exact shape of a skull there's a little bit of difference um from the skull sh that exact skull shape but um you've kind of got a balance between what is accurately summarizing the skull shape and the computational power that it's not necessary to have um too many harmonics so we used 12 harmonics. Um, it's actually quite complicated to try and get your head around. There's a few um, videos on YouTube that you could have a look at, um, which kind of describe it in more detail. It shows it visually. Um, so we took this shape data and then created what we, um, a morphospace, so a summary of the morphology. Um, as this is the empirical morphospace, uh, using a, a process called principal components analysis. And that basically reduces the amount of data and extracts the axes of highest variability. So it's a graph that basically summarizes uh, the variation in jaw morphology. And this is the example from Deacon's paper again. So this is, this is the fish. Um, and then what happens to that is you can extract that data and reconstruct the jaws um, and also extend it so you've got a more um, 
uh, uh, broader boundaries for that data. And then you've got a basically a theoretical morpher space. So you've not you've got jaws that don't actually exist in real life, but you can kind of test the variability that you've got within all of your sample. So these are the metrics that are being tested. Uh, von Mises stress, so it's a, a metric of um, stress resistance. So if you imagine um, some stress being applied to the end of a jaw, and it's the point at which the jaw will fail, and that is the, uh, the strength of the jaw. That's what von Mises stress is, um, is measuring. And that's kind of, it's an average across the entire jaw. Um, and then rotational efficiency is essentially, oh, I'm going back there, um, how efficient the rotation is around a certain point. So say around that point, which is the jaw joint. Um, and it's basically the, imagine you tap the jaw with this distinct amount of energy, and it's the amount that that jaw will rotate around that point given a consistent amount of energy. And the more it will rotate around that point, the more efficient the jaw is because it's using more of that energy that you're putting in to actually rotate. Um, and that can actually be used in two different ways. Obviously, a, um, a metric of efficiency, but also it's a metric of speed as well because if you put the same amount of energy in, it rotates by a um, rotates by a, a larger amount, that's basically closing faster. Um, but in this case, I was kind of using more as um, the efficiency of closure. So this is how uh, my data set plots onto the mor uh, morpho space. Uh, we have the aquatic animals in blue, the semi-aquatic in red, and the terrestrial in green. Um, and you can see that they do split very uh, evenly with the one with a transitional morphology in the well, kind of in the middle. It sort of goes off a little bit as well. Um, and so this is where these plot the hippos are all the way at the top. There are things like the deer and the um, the sheep there over this side, and then you've got the early whales plotting in between, then the archaeocetes also in between but further to that side, and then the modern whales are all the way to that end. So what we're seeing here is, I uh, guess phylogeny that plots onto it, um, I, I don't have access to the um, software anymore, so I wasn't able to actually figure out a way to plot it on uh, for this talk. But you can kind of see these are all the points that were on that other graph. And it shows that the uh, whales are evolving in that direction and the um, terrestrial tax of the deer and all that sort of thing are evolving in this direction, away from this common ancestor, which is in red. So what does that mean in terms of the functional metrics that I was talking about? So we've got stress resistance and rotational efficiency. This is how... Um, these plot as sort of heat maps. Um, if you look at these jaws here, it was testing all these uh, these jaws on the morpher space. And this is so essentially what happens is stress resistance is higher with the um, with higher values of principal component two. So um, more towards these jaws up here, the more sort of thicker jaws, essentially, which does make sense intuitively that a thicker jaw will be stronger. Um, and then rotational efficiency is, is higher towards that end. So we don't have, they're not um, at values of the, the highest values in the same point on the graph. Um, but they're also not completely opposing each other. They're kind of going in slightly different directions. And so there's going to be a little bit of a trade-off between the two because you can't have a jaw with the highest strength and also the highest rotational efficiency. Um, and this is 
basically what happens is that when whales um, re-enter the water, there's this massive shift towards higher rotational efficiency, which works with hypothesis one that um, the um, the water would um, impose a constraint on the um, evolution of jaws. And there's this huge gap between the terrestrial and um, aquatic groups, which suggests that there's a, quite a strong uh, selection pressure from the environment. Um, ah, oh, oh, oh. Also show that statistically when this was tested, the amount of space that is occupied by the, um, the whales and with the outgroup taxa, there's actually a, um, they, they don't vary by that much. They're quite similar in the amount of space that they occupy in the morpho space, which means that the, um, the evolution to um, an aquatic condition is not actually constraining the, uh, the uh, shape of the jaws that much compared to the terrestrial morphology. It's, it's, there was probably a constraint there, but it's not a, so much of a constraint that is not also being uh, put upon by a terrestrial morphology as well, terrestrial um, ecology as well. So if we look at the diet of, uh, of these whales, this is a slightly reduced uh, morpho space because we don't have the diet for the extinct uh, creatures. Uh, we look at the apex predators, so things like killer whales, they're sort of shifting to an area of higher jaw strength, which makes sense. They're biting through things that have um, tougher, tougher bodies, like uh, in some cases turtles, uh, things that struggle more, like seals. Um, but it's, they're not exclusively in this area, so they're kind of... Um, one of those hypotheses was sort of correct there. Um, we look here the zooplanktivores, the filter feeders, and they're sort of going to an area of higher rotational efficiency, but there's still a few that are not, not in a high area of rotational efficiency, which is a bit odd. Um, it, was, it was kind of counter to one of the hypotheses, which I think the reason for, one of the, for this is because of that, what I said about the, um, the jaws of whales being separate at the front. They've got an elastic symphysis. Um, but what that also means is that they can rotate outwards as well. They don't just rotate um, to close. So this simulation of 2D, two-dimensional jaw closure is not actually capturing the, the real process. Um, I mean, it's not capturing the real process for everything absolutely, but it's especially um, inaccurate for, jaw, for, for uh, baleen whales. Um, so maybe an, another analysis to, uh, that can simulate that twist in the jaws as well could possibly um, vindicate that hypo hypothesis. Um, so if we look at the strategy, so the last one was diet, so it's the things that they're eating. This in stra the strategy is how they're eating them. So we're looking at raptorial feeding here, which is just snapping of the jaws. Uh, suction feeding, which is using water to suck in prey. Combination feeding is doing a bit of both of those. Skim feeding and lunge feeding are kinds of uh, filter feeding. And then we've got terrestrial and then extinct versions of what we have above. What you find is this kind of three-stage uh, transition across, which maps, well, sort of maps onto the contours of the rotational efficiency, showing that the suction feeding actually does require higher rotational efficiency than the raptorial feeding. And that, that combination feeding shows that there's a kind of trade-off between the two. Um, there's not, it's not really, the raptorial feeding are not really in an area of high stress resistance. So there's not really a, a good hypothesis as to why the raptorial feeders have this kind of uh, morphology um, over the combination feeders. Um, also find that 
this area here with the, all of the a lot of the extinct creatures, they are um, at an area of low rotational efficiency as well. And you see a shift towards higher rotational efficiency over the evolution of uh, whales over time as well. So I didn't really look at this so much in my master's project, but I did a few more um, analyses and looked at the uh, optimality. And the areas of the dark areas are actually the higher, um, most more optimal areas. And what I actually find is that the jaws are not evolving towards optimal areas of uh, morphology. They're actually evolving away from them. So this is the terrestrial group as away from an optimal trade-off between the two uh, metrics. And then the whales are also not in an area of optimal trade-off as well. What you do find is a couple of creatures there in the optimal trade-off, and that's a hippo. So a hippo has like an optimal trade-off between um, jaw strength and rotational efficiency. And there's also an odd early whale there as well. Um, very strange. But it does show that the, um, the whales are not optimized for jaw strength. They are optimizing their jaws for rotational efficiency. One caveat is that there is a very, there's a strong relationship in the entire data set between the shape of the jaw and the size of the creature. So um, in whales, it's a significant relationship, but it's not that, not quite that strong. In the whole data set, it's a strong relationship, and in the terrestrial uh, data set, it's very strong. So it seems to be some, um, the size also has an effect on the jaws, not just the habitat and not just the um, diet as well. Um, so that's my talk. And if this will actually, there we go. My whale pun for the day as well. Um, have we got any questions?